I first want to thank Arco <laughs> for last week. I already did a great job, and uh, you know, um, um, I'm sure you guys are now very well aware of uh, the Gramscian notion of the war of position and the war of maneuver and uh, what hegemony and counter hegemony really are in terms of this political aspect of this. This is also working on in philosophy because, you know, there is always this class struggle in theory that is going on, of which uh, I want to just point this out that Louis Althusser, who has got a tremendous uh, Gramsci and background more or end this course, um, talks of uh, philosophy as a, a, a comp plus, a place of struggle in which, you know, the class struggle is in theory. Right? I mean, it's not denying practice, but part of the philosophy is a class struggle in theory. And he's obviously taking this up from Gramsci's war of position. Where we are today, we're really in the educational state apparatus. This is really where the the, the struggle is to win, win, you know, win over common sense, as I mentioned two weeks ago. Again, a, a crucial term in God. So Kant comes from, uh, from Kant. You know, it's a German word, struggle of ideas, a place of struggle. And uh, this is where Kant saw the contest of the faculties. This is not such a new concept <laughs> in terms of the history of, uh, of uh, uh, German philosophy. Certainly the um, uh, the uh, Kantian notion was basically <coughs> on the conflicts between philosophy, law, theology during his period, right, etc. For Althusser, it becomes class struggle in theory, in the theoretical, right? You can see this playing out. Yeah. So again, uh, the war position, um, for our purposes, is really in what, what uh, Althusser will call part of the ideological state apparatuses that we talked about vis-a-vis -vis common sense as an extension of Gramsci's notion of hegemony and counter-hegemony. Um, and uh, again, this word is, you know, or this, this term is crucial in Gramsci, one of the most complicated, multi-layered and ambiguous terms in, in his uh, thinking. Uh, at the one, one hand, it, it, I guess I could say it's, um, it's not really a negative, but it's a place where, you know, um, uh, value systems are created, uh, common sense of a, a direct, as in the sense of a direction, right, how values are formed. You could think of it as kind of like the formation of a cultural and collective superego is going on in common sense as well. Um, at the same time, uh, the common sense sometimes it's very historical that this is where the inventory is taking place. How does something become common sense? Part of the historical background and narrative. How did this happen? How do we say, well, how does the slogan, that's the way it is, come about? What did it mean? How does it, you know, happen, right? Um, you know, show me the money. Where does that, you know, <laughs> come from, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So he's, he's looking at these things and basically how at least in the, this um, um, prison notebook entry we're reading of, um, of Gramsci's on the study of philosophy, how, how philosophy comes, becomes popularized into popular slogans and things like that is also a result of, of common sense in, in a lot of ways. Uh, so, um, you know, in, in other words, common sense has part of the vernacular with it as well. You know, how do we get to idiomatics and the vernacular too? So again, a very complicated uh, term that we'll probably come back to when we read, uh, obviously, Althusser and we read other uh, uh, um, um, theorists that are very influenced by Gramsci. I think of all the people we'll be reading in the next, uh, you know, six weeks um, that uh, Althusser is most directly influenced by Antonio Gramsci. Sartre did not read Gramsci until the 70s. You know, at least this is what he claimed which was very late in his career. Sartre was, uh, you know, legally blind the last uh, five, six years of his life, you know, and, uh, you know, but he did have Gramsci read to him uh, uh, in, the, in the 70s and was really taken by him. Um, I, I don't think uh, Blue Cox was really aware of uh, Gramsci. Uh, certainly Kojev and other people of that ilk were not really taken by Gramsci's 
philosophical writings or his writings from uh, prison so much they may have been aware of him, but in terms of influence, not that much, right? So, um, you know, and um, uh, the Frankfurt School, I don't think there's one mention of Antonio Gramsci that hmm. I know of. Uh, I may have to check again, but I don't think there's any mention of Antonio Gramsci's work or of the notion of the organic intellectual or on hegemony, some of the terms we associate with him, or any reflections on the modern prince and the state and uh, civil society. I do want to mention, and I don't know if Arto went there, but something in terms of a background um, to, to Gramsci's distinctions between civil society and the state and what he's doing in some levels with the war of position and the war of maneuver. And this will come up later today when we do a critique of the Gotha program in the other class. But the one, one text worthy of reading and studying, I mean, among many others, is the philosophy of right, 1821 of Hegel. Uh, the philosophy of law, recht, in German, really. It's, uh, you know, translated as philosophy of law into French droit. Um, is is uh, is where the distinctions are, are are drawn out between civil society and the state and the family, and of course most of you know that in 1843 Marx writes the critique of Hegel's philosophy of the state in 1843 on the contributions of uh, the philosophy of the state and and um, begins with Proposition 261 and this begins Marx's analysis of the collapse between civil society and the state. And this will be interesting in terms of, you know, what is social democracy versus that of what is a communist transition, et cetera. So I, I want to mention this. And Gramsci is very well aware of this text of the Hegelian moment. Okay? So um, anyway, Arto, you want to add anything? Uh, maybe how to extend? I mean, I'm going to go back to sections of the study of philosophy. Um, you know, and then move on to Marx. Yeah, yeah, yeah please, yeah. Can I just yeah. ask about your, you're talking about the, um, the yep. circulation of Gramsci's ideas and there was some mm -hmm. delay. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that just an issue of translation or were there ideological reasons? Because I think uh, you said that he was prominent in his lifetime uh, in Italy. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, he was prominent to a group of people yeah. during his lifetime because yeah, he was in prison yeah, yeah. for a good part of that time. And, and as I mentioned, you know, without Pietro Schraffa, and uh, friends, he never really, really these notebooks probably would not have seen the light of day. And, and then Togliatti after the war, who was his friend and also the head of the uh, Italian Communist Party. Um, I think, I mean, probably a lot of reasons. I mean, I think some people considered him the Frankfurt School, which, you know, in my opinion, is the most intellectual of the groups, right? I, I don't think they really thought, saw Gramsci as any more than a vulgar Marxist in some ways, that they see, see this as a kind of reductionist historicism. I mean, this is the way they would argue it, I, I think, you know, that never really, they never really broadened out to the level that they broadened out or where they were coming from. Also, the old divide between, you know, maybe a German <laughs> education and then a, a, a kind of working class or son of a bureaucrat, you know, from Sardinia versus an elite group of, you know, well affluent um, you know, Jewish, uh, you know, intelligentsia, you know, so in one reason, maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm very much speculating here, and, uh, um, um, and you know, the famous saying of, um, of Lukács about Adorno, he took up residence in the Grand Hotel Abyss, right, <laughs> which is the title of, uh, of uh, Jeffrey's uh, uh, study of uh, the Frankfurt School. So, in a way, you know, you're dealing with one, that, that aspect. I think um, also he was not known outside of direct movement circles until the 19, late 50s, early 60s. So in Althusser, because of the party affiliation, the Italians and the French Communist Party, and Althusser was a member of the party, was one who was influenced and read him seriously. Yeah. Sartre, again, Sorbonne, <laughs> educated, you know, writer, privileged stipend area of Gallimard, never really encountered him until he made his, you know, the radical conversion to Marxism later in his life after being the quote, quote father of French existentialism, so in some ways. Kojev, who's lecturing on Hegel, went the, went the way of all flesh, you know, he went 
the way uh, towards, uh, you know, de Gaulle. He became a Gaullist after the war. So even though uh, um, uh, Kojev was an operative, you know, in in uh, um, in France from '33 uh, till, I mean, really for most of his time in France up until after the world after World War, his lectures on Hegel were really lectures that were coded on as Marx. Right, if you read them carefully, his Kant book is his Hegel book. His Hegel lectures are his Marx, <laughs> right, or kind of an amalgamation. So there are these kind of things. So I don't think he's really aware of Gramsci, nor was it the same kind of thing because Gramsci is again, you know, trying to rid himself of the Hegelian influence of Croce, this kind of idealism. So it wouldn't play as well to the quote French uh, Hegelians in some ways. So after the war, uh, you know, to go back to how this may have been received, you know, the Italian Communist Party put out his work, his letters, and his notebooks, and there became a, a group of people, especially in Italy, who, you know, reoriented this. Obviously, Pasolini helped, uh, you know, as being someone very taken by Gramsci. You know, you had a cultural, you know, renaissance around his writings. Um, at the same time, it was not until um, the middle to late 60s and really in the 70s that Gramsci really entered the United States. And it was Paul Picconi, one the uh, the uh, head of Telos magazine, Carl Boggs, a historian and political scientist, um, you know, a few other people that kind of oriented Gramsci's studies. And then there was a flourish, you know, after that that, that, that took off. But mostly not through philosophy departments, mostly through politics, political science departments, and a few history departments. Boggs was in history at, at LSU, um, you know, in, uh, in uh, Louisiana. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. also part yeah. of the reason is that, yeah. um, I mean, in my, my opinion is that yeah. uh, people like the Frankfurt School, that, you know, there's this big difference in early, before World War II in, in the, on the revolutionary left between sort of like the actual revolutionary, like organic intellectuals like Gramsci, who right. was uh, thinking of philosophy as sort of like a practical logic and people like Adorno and all the people in the Frankfurt School. Uh, so it's like the difference between um, like Lenin, who's still not considered a major philosopher in the Marxist tradition, but sort of like a vulgar. Uh, my teacher said that at the grad school, Marshall Berman, he said, you know, there's a reason why the Lenin reader is like maroon and it's not red. And at this point, like, <laughs> he said that? Yeah, you can't. He didn't say it was because of Robert Tucker's yeah. bad aesthetic? You can't yeah. 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 Seriously, because they don't understand that that the high point of the revolutionary <laughs> sort of philosophical thought was the practical application of the, uh, you know. So I think Gramsci pro probably is, is the closest person in, in, in his similarities to a person like Lenin. So sort of the synthesis of his read Hegel, Marx, the entire Western philosophical tradition. Uh, but he also doesn't have time to write books because, you know, he's in jail or he's part of the Communist Party, he's in Parliament and he's doing politics. So, you know, like Lenin said, if he had more time, he would have written books but he doesn't have time, so he writes articles and pamphlets. Yeah. So, uh, whereas Adorno didn't really do any politics. Yeah. I mean, he, he did politics in his yeah. own way, but they were completely ineffective. Yeah. You know? uh, and part of the reason why the German Communist Party was so ineffective, I mean, they, they would blame like Stalinism or whatever, is it because they didn't really have these kinds of organic intellectuals on this level who would combine you know, an actual involvement with the political struggle with a synthesis of the philosophical a ammunition coming from from uh, the ideas of the tradition, and I think this is the kind yeah. of the irrelevancy well, of the Frankfurt yeah. School. Yeah. I think yeah. when it comes to revolutionary politics, uh. yeah, they expelled Korsh. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I don't know. That's just my yeah, like, yeah. I just wanted to add to that. School. I think you <laughs> raised a good point. Let <laughs> me just add and I'll go to yeah. Uh, the the thing that uh, Arto brings up here that's interesting. Gramsci started as a journalist. He's a writer of the everyday. He's a political writer. He's a he's a journalist with an extremely valuable political you know but he was education. In philosophy, but he's trained in philosophy. This is part of this this kind of educational mix. He's also someone that's very interested in problems of education, per se. You know what are the schools going to look like? What is this really going to be for the future of the movement? So these are the questions that are going on in his mind, whereas the Frankfurt School is really interested much more in the cultural apparatus. The difference is God, Gramsci knows how to load, load the gun and pull the trigger, and will do so. Adorno and them will study the gun, 
right? <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it might be a very maybe a useful analogy yeah. to think of it this way. They, you know, they don't in, have in the same sense. education. Yeah. Right? They're yeah. all like had a college education right. at a time, and most right. people didn't go right. to college, so they're highly educated yeah. people. But yeah. but Lukacs, who's the other figure. He did carry a gun. Like he right. was involved in the 1990s. I don't have mine on today. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot the strap. That's, that's part of the, and I think that's part of the interesting right. kind of weakness right. of the left right. after World War II right. in Western yeah. Europe is yeah. that it didn't really have. Yeah. It never really had this revolutionary tradition. Right. It was mostly in the East right. or outside of Europe. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and then the Soviets lost it too after World War II. Right. Sure. So it, it please, you wanted to add? Yeah. Well, I yeah. was just going to yeah. comment. Yeah. That I, yeah. I think the event of World War II, the Holocaust, I think is part of you know, what Adorno and the Frankfurt School are trying to contend with. And I think it does maybe push them in a more nihilistic direction, you know, a certain, not exactly hopelessness, but just a sense of the termination, the sort of the end of, of it rather than, and so they're, they're sort of trying to contend with that, you know, sort of time and history have come to an end almost, you know, there's a kind of, how do we restart from this point? So that's how, Whereas Gramsci is, you know, situated to, so differently. Well, he's a party member, yeah. one, you know, as Arto's speaking about. He is a member of the party, right? He's a founding member yeah. of the party. But see, this he's is an a, interesting yeah, point yeah, that, yeah, that Adorno yeah. and, and right. Marcuse, they, you know, they, they left, uh, they fled from Nazism. But other people who are revolutionary philosophers did not. Like, for example, there's Pulitzer, you know, the George Pulitzer, yeah. psychologist yeah. who yeah. died at a very young age, you know, because he was a member of the resistance. He did not flee. I mean, th these are difficult questions, of course. But at that decisive moment, the moment of the big fight, you know, between these uh, epochal forces, some of these philosophers did not flee. They fought, you know? Pulitzer, Gramsci in the West, Sartre did not, I mean, Sartre in a different way. To say nothing of the Soviet Union, all of the major figures, like Ilenkov, Lifshitz, all the people who were in their 20s and 30s, who were sort of like Lukács' friends, they all literally fought it. They, they joined the army. You know, Ilenkov actually ended up fighting all the way until Berlin. So, so it's an interesting, I think, take on what does it mean to be a, a Marxist. You know, you can either, at the decisive moments, you can either take this step, you know, or I think this is sort of where Lukács has this dislike of Adorno. You know, when you made that, that oh, yeah. comment. Oh, yeah. No, there's no like question You did not yeah. fight. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Maybe there's a free kind of bourgeois malaise. Yeah. Mm. You know, yeah. which is, I mean, I don't know if it's understandable, but it's easy to fall into that, you know, if you imagine it in, in, in that moment. other bourgeois thinkers like Lukács did not fall Well, I mean, you know, but you raise the question of <laughs> is it better... I mean, if you can flee and you think you're going to make a contribution and you're going to be abroad, or do you stay there and risk your life, et cetera? In Adorno, Marcuse, or Horkheimer's case, it was probably very clear to them that they would be, you know, probably exterminated or the capital would be, and they had a much better chance of making a contribution by coming here. So I don't know if it's just, you know, like a Pulitzer, he's, he's working in Vichy, France. He's arrested by the Gestapo. He laughs at them when they try to interrogate him. He's giving lectures underground all his life. This is, you know, someone who, uh, you know, was very well connected to, you know, he's a very good friend of Jacques Lacan, you know, in, 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 in some ways. So I think the interesting thing here is, though, did the party create Right? <laughs> did the part, because the Frankfurt School were never members of, the, of any party. They never had any party affiliation. They never had an organizational structure except the intellectual organizational structure of the Institute. Right? This was an educational apparatus that was traveling as an institute. They never really had that connection to the streets. The most connection they had to the streets was Marcuse's, you know, students at San Diego, and then ultimately Angela Davis, who became, you know, the popularized version of Adorno and Marcuse's, you know, student who, you know, was out there in, on, in the streets. So I, I think it's, it's good to take into account a lot of the, I mean, I don't think we really have to choose between, I think there are very different circumstances that are, that are, that are coming out here, uh, you know, in, in many ways. And you can see it reflected in the work. The Frankfurt School has much more of a distance. They have much more of a comfort zone to think, to reflect, I think. Whereas uh, with Gramsci, you're feeling the urgency always. I mean, at least I'm feeling this in these fragments, and we'll go to that. Beth, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, what you were saying about Adorno, it's my understanding that he actively critiqued what he called actionism, 
which is action without purpose, which refuses to reflect on its own impotence. And I mean, I know his statement about, you know, what are barricades against a bomb? It's kind of ridiculous. I, I can get that. But wasn't that a product of his time and of his seeing the, the complete irrelevance of the left in the face of the fascist attack? And I mean, I mean you, can, you can kind of understand where that comes from. But this is where this is where he deviates from the tradition, which is not a problem. But for example, it's very interesting because I was reading um, sort of Marx um, through the filter through this Heideggerian kind of thinker, uh, Schurman, who's Michael's teacher, one of his teachers, Rainer Schurman. Right. And the the, the 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 whole point of Marx was that Marx himself, when he elevated the proletariat into the revolutionary agent in the Communist Manifesto, there's no objective basis for him at the time to have done that. Like the proletariat was very small in Europe, right? We're talking about small society, a number of people, a small social class within a mostly peasant society. Um, but Marx, to himself, he basically this was the thinking, and this is sort of what Gramsci replicates and kind of develops, and then in all this other tradition. So the, tra the Marxist tradition forks, and Marx basically said, you know, I despise you know German liberalism and liberalism in general. So if we're going to fight revolutionary politics. We have to not counter the effects of capitalist politics, but its very premise, right? So this becomes the, the starting point of, of Marx himself, like for his politics. To call yourself a, a, a communist or whatever means you, you challenge and you negate the very premises of liberal society, right? Not its effects, not the inequality, not the imperialist violence, not the, you know, the exploitation of work, but the premise of the society, right? So in order to fight that, though, you have to create a new political force that doesn't exist. So it's a process of invention. So he basically designated this thing called the proletariat as a revolutionary agent. So it was, it was an act of, of uh, political strategy, right? The Hegelian negation, rejecting capitalist liberal values, uh, happened by inventing a new revolutionary subject which was only an invention in Marxist time, in the beginning of Marxist time, right. but it became a reality 100 years later by Gramsci's time, right? So, so, so uh, and you act accordingly. Now Adorno's, I think, and the Frankfurt School position is different. They don't necessarily follow that particular Marxist um, um, uh, energy, that, that kind of inversion. It's a different kind of a take on, on, on how to deal with capitalist politics, and I think that's the big difference. And isn't, yeah. isn't at that point, aren't they, I mean, the Frankfurt School, by the time they get here, uh, especially, like they're trying to figure out what revolutionary subject can possibly exist right. rather than having a revolutionary subject right. to write strategy. Right, how do you reinvent to go back to the invent? By the way, Stephen Marcus to, wrote a very good essay. In other words, know, they have to take that action. If it failed, it failed. But in mm -hmm. other words, you know, Marx said that capitalists always invent new things. They always invent new, that's part of its creativity, right? It always destroys the thing that it exists. It doesn't care about the present that always has to has an eye to the future, right? It welcome, yeah. welcomes it. But but the left kind of forgot that by by the 1930s, especially, right? And especially in the West. And they, they just sort of forgot that you need to invent things. You can't just think about how to invent it. We actually have to do it. You know, well, yeah, you have, the, I mean, you have to take that plunge. I mean, the know. crucial <laughs> subject matter here is where is the agent? What is revolutionary agency at this point? For the Frankfurt School, revolutionary agency did not really exist at, at a certain moment. What they were really doing is trying to understand what are the mechanisms that are produced and new views had effects. I think it's better put, you know, if you just say what mechanisms can we study here in terms of the F scale, the fascist scale, the authoritarian personality, the use of propaganda and language, all of these things as well as philosophically trying to stay within a materialist standpoint. So I think they're all coming from the same premises. You know, not that the, the Frankfurt School is against revolutionary upsurge. I think the real question here is really, who is the revolutionary subject? Who is the agent? And for, for Marcuse, it's clear during the 60s that he, he basically has forgotten the working class. 
There's no proletariat to him as agency anymore. It's students and coalition with the third world. He says this explicitly, you know, in his in his later writings in the 60s and early early 70s. This is the new agent in a way. You know, some people thought that the black revolutionaries, the the Black Panthers, were kind of like the the avant garde of this. So this this has always I think been a real real problem. Lukács, you know, was always about agency, his own agency, which is admirable in his case that he actually lived it, practiced it, and, you know, etc. It may have hurt his thinking at certain times. Some people think this, that the socialist realist phase did, kept him away from experimental writing, which had a great <coughs> force on people. You know, he didn't read Joyce, he didn't read Kafka, he didn't read Faulkner, he never really studied these people. He wanted to stay in the historical novel, right, <laughs> etc., and, and see the novel only as epic form, and you know, and it's disillusion. He didn't really go the way of experimental work. You know, the Dadaists and the Surrealists were anathema to him, whereas to Benjamin, the Surrealists were something. To Adorno, they weren't. So you have all these really, I mean, very strange complexities around everything from art to agency to the political implications of, of this. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the Italians, because they had an active resistance during right. World War II, which you can see in films like Open City, right. and you move that all the way to the Red Brigades and Negri and all of them, you have... Well, that Negri, Negri would, no, it's, I like the leap, but I don't think Negri would say he went to jail for I, no, that trumped up charge of being the theoretician would, of the But if he were brigades. here now, he would smile. He, he would kind of smile, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Anyway, yeah, go ahead, David. I'm sorry, it's a good discussion. I mean, it's, it's important. Yeah, yeah. and if this yeah. is, yeah. you know, but yeah. the, um, uh, I'm curious, and too, about the relationship uh, that, um, like, Birmingham, uh, cultural studies has with Gramsci versus the, the uh, well that's that's the, that the educational Gramsci. import I don't know if that yeah I mean that's the edge Stuart Hall obviously is tremendously influenced by Antonio Gramsci yeah tremendously I mean, Gramsci was very, very important to this, including the, the, the theory of the subaltern, you know, that class, and can the subaltern speak, and, you know, this whole... Uh, this whole yeah, yeah, by Spivak, and Stanley responded to that, uh, you know, et cetera. And, uh, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, th 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 that was that trend, but that was part of the educational apparatus at work around Gramsci post-Althusser into Birmingham, right? This was the New Left Review crowd, one generation after E.P. Thompson, or the new generation after E.P. Thompson, yeah. that started this in terms of the cultural studies in the Birmingham school. Mm -hmm. But this would became intellectual, and we were talking about this formation of Western Marxism, and Chris raises an interesting point because the Italians had this history of resistance, which was in some ways even more active, much more active than the French. And you can see this reflected in the films. You know, oh, yeah. the Rossolinis, the Antiannonis, the Elio Petri, all of the these uh, filmmakers actually give you a much greater sense about what the resistance was about, whereas the French have kind of glorified, you know, in a way. And it wasn't as active as a lot of people thought. <laughs> they, they were, they were much more collaborations. Much more, no, well, they jump into bed, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's, that's their, yeah, the French yeah. were 3% of the population. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> anyway, the Italians, yes, you can see with, with Gramsci the influence, and then, of course, there's a, there's a movement away from Gramsci by various schools, too with De La Volpe. Negre is an anti-Gramscian in some ways. Well, we'll talk about this later in the semester, how Negre, uh, you know, kind of uh, gives up this uh, Gramscian moment. And, you know, they're, they're arguing against the party and also the Gramscian moment in the, in the, in the party. Yeah, I mean, this is the Negre, this is the autonomy, uh, autonomy um, uh, group, right, the, um, of, the, of the 70s, uh, going back to the, the Red, the Red, the Rosa Brigada. Yeah, in, in a way. So, um, um, so I mean, you know, this is a very good question. I mean, why Gramsci, you know, in a way, look, he's working class. He's a hunchback, <laughs> right? He's, he's in prison. All of these factors, right? He's speaking really directly, I think, more to a new kind of person, a new kind of figure, right, in a way. He's not all about the cultural, he's about work as well, <laughs> you know, and culture, you know, and he's about revolutionary insurrection, as Arto probably uh, spoke about last time. You don't start talking about, the Frankfurt School does not talk about war. They don't really have any theories about war either. 
You know, yeah. this is something very under-theorized that you learn from the Italians. Machiavelli says, in times of peace, study war even more seriously. <laughs> right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this goes way back in this in this tradition. Yeah. yeah. What are we going to add? I, I'm sorry. I, I mean, Korsha actually goes and says Marx's writings after, bef you know, after 1850 are really no longer driven by revolutionary thought. They're more driven in, in, in theory. You know, that's, he says that's more of his theoretical period. But where he was actually engaged in, you know, pre-1850 mm -hmm. was, was his real revolutionary period. Well, we could talk about that today when we make the transition to the economic and philosophical manuscripts, the 1844 yeah. Paris manuscripts. But th this is a good, I mean, you know, really in a way, you know, Gramsci and Lukács were really men of practical reason you know, in many ways. The Frankfurt School's practical reason is keeping the funds flowing so that they could keep the <laughs> institute alive. I don't mean to, you know, say this is really a, 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 it is a class struggle in terms of theory in some ways because the Frankfurt School did come from extremely, you know, well off, you know, uh, people. I mean, you know, they had time to reflect. They had what the Greeks said, you know, the scholia. They had, t you know, leisure time, you know, to work with. You know, this, what we're reading, is the result of a man up against the wall, literally, you know, in a prison cell, and jottings, you know, theoretical jottings that are filled with force and have nuggets in them, etc. These are not long studies, you know, and, and again, the Frankfurt School branches out into many more areas than most of the, quote, Soviet, you know, I mean, they had more specialized. The Frankfurt School, to me, is more of a, of a, 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 a total approach to this through the personality structure, through the economic, the political economy. They had people that did all of this, right? The, the music, the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, obviously the, um, the, the, the studies of um, aesthetics that we get, that we, you know, we did earlier today with Walter Benjamin. So this is a different, different animal at work and, and different culture, yeah, in a sense. So I, I think it's important. But yes, agency is really the, the question here. And the Frankfurt School had no theory of agency. You know, I think they were very happy to have the connection to the Black Panthers, to Angela Davis. I think they were very happy, especially Marcusa, who gave a lot of money to her defense fund. Not as much as Aretha Franklin, but gave, you know, gave, gave some, you know, uh, you know, wrote a check, you know, to, to get Sister Angela out of out of prison, right, and, you know, et cetera. So the, these are, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're very interesting moments. Look, we're, we're trying to look at these various schools, right, and what becomes Marxism. <coughs> I'm not so much in agreement with Korsh, because I think Marx remained militant, organizationally militant to the end, and that the theory is budding, it matures, you know, et cetera. I mean, yes, he retreated somewhat into the British Library, but he still founded the IWA, he founded, you know, he stayed with the First International, and until his death, he was still in conversation about revolution and about, you know, yeah. I well, mean, I mean, like, I mean yeah. he's not he's not that negative about, but he said right. his real right. his real revolutionary uh, right. uh, theory was really more in his early. Okay. So when he, he was engaged, Althusser will give a debate about that. You know, yeah. I mean, Althusser yeah. will say that really what. Marx was on the cups, cusp of was a complete new epistemological subject, right? And a whole new epistemology and creating a whole new language in terms of understanding this system, both, you know, critically and analytically. And this, this is something that, you know, political. Yeah. The question is, what is the political? Does the political mean politics and thinking? Is thinking agency? Is Castiaradis, when he says in 1964, we have to think before we act? you know, what Beth was mentioning about the actionism that Adorno criticizes, you know, uh, you know, uh, in a sense, Plato, and this goes all the way back, you know, historically in philosophy to Plato's seventh letter, you know, should the philosopher be involved in politics? And Plato <laughs> concludes no after getting disappointed in Syracuse with his ex-student, with Dion, right? So this this goes way back. It's a it's a you know in, in a sense Aristotle's run out of Athens. Socrates is sacri you know is killed right. I mean even though Nietzsche says he had a death wish you know it, it's you know so it's interesting in that moment you know should there be you know and Badiou brings this up. I mean even Badiou who's really in some ways you know a, a, a um, 
uh, should I put this, I mean, it's a kind of Maoism in philosophy. There's always this conceptual overturning going on and, you know, a kind of revolution and thought always operating in his, in his history. Even he will say that sometimes the, the, there's that separation that needs to be maintained. So, yeah, so, yeah, please, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think yeah. that we could learn something from that perspective on actionism. I mean, Sorry. I think there's a, a lot of reflexive activity on the left, right. and sometimes it gets turned into an anti-intellectualism. Sure. Witness Ocasio-Cortez's recent statements about study and ideology are bougie. Mm. Oh, she said that? Oh, my God. Yeah, that's bougie. She said... I didn't need to grow up. And she's not I didn't need to grow up with books. My mother was, you know, a working class. Who said this? What a This is the cover of Vogue magazine. She's the Democratic. This is the cover of Vogue magazine. The new golden girl of the Democratic. Did not grow up in the Bronx either. Had like some cousins there. Yeah, that's a complete lie. Yeah, but but she was she was I think called to account for. No, actually, this was her um, interview in Vogue, and she said, she said, people have said I'm not ideological enough, and she said, you know, that's, that's just a bougie reflection. I don't, we didn't need those kinds of books to study when I was growing up. We knew, we knew the score. They don't know the score. Uh. That's part of the problem. <laughs> if they really knew the score, we could we could really follow. But that's kind of my don't. point that's about about, about yeah, um, yeah. thoughtless actionism. Yeah. yeah. You know, we know what to do. We just got to be in the streets. Mm. Oh, or do these you know funeral dirge demonstrations? Mm. Look, th this opens well, up. You know, Gramsci right? uh, again one of his great I mean, contributions, right? and this is okay. Marx really in a way, <laughs> and Hegel in a different way. That there's no what real distinction do? between do theory and actual. <laughs> the there's border. no real distinction yeah. between theory and practice. This is something that was created by the Cartesian dualism. Mm -hmm. He's always working in this ah. tradition of this, and that unless we unless we have this theoretical investiture and constantly are struggling with this in a way and know it, right? We're going to be lost. You know, I mean, we're just sitting ducks for this. You know, in, in, in so many ways. I mean, this 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 is the, really the problem. And Gramsci is one of the first to st to say this is dichotomous thinking. What this Ocasio is going through in a way which is so far not only from communism, it's far from socialism, even from a transitional moment. You know, I mean, this is yeah. never no, what no, I know. I know. the left was. Yeah. You know, right. in Robin Kelly's wonderful book about communists in. Alabama, hammer communists, or Hammer and Ho. Right. He's got this incredible spine-tingling story about interviewing one of the working class, very poor black activists, and he said, how did, how did you do it? And the guy opens the drawer next to his bed, which is basically a pallet, and he brings out a dog-eared copy of Lenin and a box of shotgun shells, and he says, <laughs> That thar. Arto is really likes that. That thar theory in practice. That thar theory in practice. Well, one of the great films. But, 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 but that was reading. That yeah. was reading, you know? Yeah, People read, so Hall what Cortez said is so <laughs> ignorant. It's so ignorant of the yeah. history of the left. Yes. Well, it's a disgrace because the word socialism is being used. That's that's part of the problem. And in a way, what this sets up is incredibly good fodder mm -hmm. for Fox News and yeah. other things. If you've got any researchers at Fox News, they're going to say, this woman's not a socialist. Socialists believe in this. Why are they using this label? What is this? Well, I think she's structure? trying to run from it. Yeah. And she's running from it, too. Well, I don't yeah. think she ever was there to run from. Oh, what were the books what, in Fred Hampton's There was a little background. film made about, you know, the assassination oh, no. and that they found all these, uh, you know, books. It's a film? Yeah, it's a film called The Books in Fred Hampton's Apartment. Wow. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got to read. Read and study. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it's about. And fight. And have the shotgun shells, yes, ready there with the shotgun if you want. With I mean, the Lenin. You know, in a way. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, in, in a sense. I mean, I'm not, listen, for, 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 for Gramsci, philosophy is an arm and it's an apparatus of the, 
of the revolution. The revolution is always first and foremost. And I think in most of these people's minds, I don't think the Frankfurt School thought this was a possibility. Gramsci did think the movement was a possibility. I think the Frankfurt School thought through pessimism in history with the hope. They left open the door a little bit that ultimately people may come to terms with this and what's going down and as a critique. It's a very powerful critique of the system, you know, in, in, in so many ways. It, it spans psychology, economics, everything, right? I mean, you know, aesthetics, et cetera. But for, for Gramsci, it's, a, it's about the movement, revolution. And the study of philosophy is to be able to be able to have concepts and categories that you can use in order as analytical and critical tools. And at the same time, how are you going to win over the common sense? This is what he's really looking at here. This is why it's the study of philosophy and why, and you brought this up too, why is history so important? Why is the history of concept formation, why is the, why is the history of, um, of socialization of ideas so important? You know, how does this idea become socialized? How does an Ocasio, or whatever her name is, how does she become, <laughs> how does she become, you know, socialized into believing these kind of tenets of socialism or to make statements like this? Where does the socialization come from? It's not a put down of her, it's really a question of how have we gotten to this point? of this kind of socialization of ideas and, and all of that. And how do we got to the, so the socialization of our revolution of Bernie Sanders? What revolution? Pre-New Deal uh, strategies? You know, I mean, look, a, a, on a good guaranteed uh, health, you know, I mean, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, single-payer health care, yeah, of course it's a big deal to the United States, you know, but in most countries they already have that globally, you know, of the advanced com uh, countries. Their, their, their health care system's already delivered, and this becomes the big issue. There's no, no talk, there's a pushback against Social Security, but there's never been an analysis that Social Security hasn't lived up to the cost of living for 45 years. It's a mi meaningless, you know, moment in terms of, of, of a government, uh, you know, uh, based uh, retirement package. None of these things are really engaged. You know, so the, the question is, how does this get socialized that people begin to accept it, and then you have a generation that comes up and says, oh, this is really radical. You know, <laughs> wow, you know, <laughs> you know, guaranteed income, <laughs> you know, et cetera. I, I don't, you know, see, so, so for me, it, it, you know, we're living in those kind of times. You know, we're well, it's, it, it, yeah. it's kind of like where we've been. Yeah, no, I know that. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. you got to climb out of a hole before you can... Yeah. Start climbing the ladder. Yeah, but I mean, I'm trying to say that the yeah, relevance yeah. of Gramsci mm -hmm. here, again, yeah. is to see how the socialization of ideas is taking place. It's not only the stupid remarks, right? It's how did this occur? What was going on in the schools all this time? What was going on in the culture at large? How does this, how does this process take hold in so many ways? How does this happen, right? Why do football players take a knee instead of raising fists mm -hmm. in the anthem? Why is it the people are on their knees, right? To what does this symbolize, in a sense, if not, you know, a kind of Christian socialism in a way, and a sympathy or a suffering? I mean, you have to think. What what is the image? What, how has that been socialized? How does that come across? Whereas Tommy Smith and John Carlos are raising fists. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're talking about power. They're not talking about sympathy with something. You know, in a way, and this is another thing that we've lost. You want to say something? Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm ranting. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Rant on. Yeah. Yeah. Thing in which Gramsci uses this like startling image. He says something like the organic intellectual is the whalebone in the corset. Yes, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's a great image. Which is really, a, I mean, it's a complicated metaphor image because I, I, I think it could be. You could use it in different ways. But yes. I think he's. Uh, you know, I've been trying to wrestle with what does he actually mean. You know, it's a sort of stiffening. Without the whalebone of the corset, the corset will get soft, and it can't actually do its work. Right. It's going to collapse, no, or it's not going to be able to <laughs> achieve <laughs> right. its purpose. Yeah. No, that's so a great whale, metaphor. You, you need yeah. the whalebone. Yeah. You know, in right. that corset to make it work. Um, right. So it's yeah. the you know relationship of in the translation it sort of uses the word I think. Relation with the intellectuals to the symbols. I don't know about the translations, but yeah, uh, the simple the simple was the term used for the Jesuitism. I was going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, just yeah, to yeah. say, you know, yeah. is, 
is the corset sort of common sense and the whalebone kind of stiffens the corset and makes it you know understand itself or anyway I think hmm. I, I've just been thinking about what it, what does he actually mean and how can one apply it to just thinking about his philosophy but it's a remarkable image also just Thinking about, of course, it itself is a question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, well, it, it, it's 19, well, yeah, really. 1930. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I heard Johnny Depp was wearing one of those to kind of keep the, the weight yes. in or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I used Maybe to it was a whalebone instead, right? Yeah. Yeah. I used to live in a city where uh, all of the Victorian houses had fainting rooms so that the women who came upstairs with the corsets could. Faint. Right. And, uh, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what page that, that <laughs> wonderful uh, image <laughs> yeah. is. Uh, yeah, I, I remember it. It's under the. It's it, it's uh, for the organic intellectual for the notion of the organic intellectual he uses. It. Yeah. Let me just see if I can find that. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful image. Right. Yeah. They don't have. Uh, yeah. Um, that doesn't work. Yeah, I think it's uh, three. Yeah, well, we'll find it. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll find it. I don't want to spend uh, whatever. But but anyway, um, go, going back to this again is um, um, again. I, I think what's crucial is how are ideas socialized. This is something we forget. How does an idea become socialized over a long period of time? And secondly of all, what is the historicity of that idea? You know, and, and then to ask the question, why is it happening? What is its, uh, you know, um, its uh, force uh, within that? And, um, um, you know, and again, this whole notion of common sense. I, I was going to go to the text for a little while and then kind of move on to Marx. We'll come back to Gramsci, too, uh, later on. Um, uh, but I wanted to make a few points he, he about... Found, he found the passage. 340. 340. 340, great. Thank you. Yes, great. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, yeah, this is a good section. Maybe we can read this a little bit. Uh, um, the never tire, and this is uh, how to replace common sense, right? And aim to replace common sense and uh, old conceptions of the world in general. Never to tire of repeating its own arguments, though offering literary variation of form. Repetition is the best didactic means for working on the popular mentality. Again, this is a practical instructions of how to win over common sense, right? Through the repetition, uh, you know, in, uh, of, um, of 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 arguments. Work incessantly to raise the intellectual level of the ever-growing strata of the populace. In other words, to give a personality, and this is nice, to give a personality to the amorphous mass element. This means working to produce elites of intellectuals, elites of intellectuals, not a bad word for him. I mean, he's using Michel and Pareto's language, and of course, Mosca, who he knows very well, Gatano Mosca, you know, who wrote on elites of a new type which arise directly out of the masses, but remain in contact with them to become, as it were, the whalebone in the current corset. And this is the organic intellection, right? Here, the whalebone in the corset. The second necessity of satisfied is what really modifies the intellectual panorama of the age, but these elites cannot be formed and developed without a hierarchy of authority and intellectual competence growing up among them. It's not just that you're smart or whatever, there's some kind of discipline to this. There is a hierarchy, right? I mean, this is not horizontalism at work, like people talk of today, right? There is a verticality here and a higher. The culmination of this process can be a great individual philosopher, but he must be capable of reliving concretely the demands of the massive ideological community and understanding that this cannot have the flexibility of movement proper to an individual brain and must succeed in giving formal elaboration to the collective do doctrine in the most relevant fashion and the one most suited to the modes of thought in a collective history. This is a very crucial passage on the formation of the organic intellectual, the type. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, 
pointing this out on what page it is. Um, yeah. So this is the organic intellectual, and, and you can see that the footnote here in the books, if you have uh, Quentin Hoare, on pages 5 through 14 in the text, he does, he does elaborate more about the traditional intellectuals and the organic intellectuals. So if you want to take, this is a crucial term in Gramsci that the Frankfurt School never really used, even though it could be applied in some cases to what they did, but this notion of the organic intellectual, right? And in my opinion, this is a transformative intellectual, a transformative type. So for me, a Jean-Francois Lyotard is a traditional intellectual, even though he's brilliant and he gives a beautiful, you know, assessment of the postmodern condition, whereas a Michel Foucault, who has elements of both Gramsci and the Frankfurt School, is a transformative intellectual. You know, it's a big difference. Denny Dottomy is a traditional medievalist scholastic, <laughs> right? But anyway, he's not really a transformative intellectual, even though if you're a read reader, you're going to be transformed by the text. But in terms of the politics of the text, you know, it has to be rethought. Right? Yeah, yeah go ahead. I'm, I'm yeah, it was interesting yeah. in that uh, yeah. that talk by uh, Mouf, uh, the g yeah, right. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't that taken with her either. Yeah. But I mean, uh, the, the other speaker was this guy, Jonathan Smucker, who has written a book called uh, Hegemony. Okay. Um, and it's really about how to organize uh, working class hegemony. Not, I don't know if he would use that term, but, you know, regular people's hegemony. I think that's what he would use. Right. I mean, look, part of the problem that I see, I mean, I'll, I'll just bridge this to my own personal experience. In the union movement, labor union movement, and even in academic unions, people don't know how to read or study. Right. This is a problem. Yeah. You don't really have the ability now to really transform conditions because there's no theory at work. It's all reaction to what the bosses do. Right? Or some kind of codes from the past without really being able to see what the actual situation is. You have to know, the great thing about philosophy, at least to me, and, and what I think Gramsci is also talking about, is how do you frame the question? This is always the important thing. How do you ask the question? This is the thing. No, whether you find the answer or not is not the most relevant thing. How do you ask the question? What is the process of engaging this question? We don't have people to do this anymore. It's all standard stock. It's like picking up a manual, you know, what he argues against in the last section of this, Problems of Marxism in this prison notebook, a manual of popular sociology. He's arguing in some ways against Bukharin's approach. We have stock responses ready for something, right? This is, this is what Bukharin did in his popular sociology. The party knows best, right? In a, in a sense, and this is not this is something that we're, we're we're going through in a very very bad way at this point, very very bad way, you know, and it's 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 uh, it, you know again a kind of horrifying moment to uh, you know to uh, people active in union circles. I think you know, I mean Karen Lewis studied Lukács in the teachers, you know, in the in the Chicago teachers. She was she was reading Lukács. They had study groups. That's why they were militant in a way. I doubt the West Virginia uh, t high school t the teachers were reading Lukács, but, but at least they had the moxie to be spontaneous at the base, something you know we can deal with with Luxembourg and Lenin later, you know, in a sense. But Gramsci's really trying to look, to go back, this is a Leninist moment. I and mean, I'm sure Arto men mentioned this last week, that there is this kind of, you know, parallelism between the Lenin idea of the vanguard, the vanguard party, and the intellectual in that vanguard party. You know, he's really trying to extend this to the educational apparatus, you know, and especially in Italy. You know, and this is very, very important to remember, you know, and, you know, in, in the schools, to build the uh, organic intellectual, first of all, you have to have a, a, and I think this is what all Western Marxism uh, 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 understood, including Adorno, who came from very privileged background, it was a visceral hatred of capitalism. You know, unless you have a visceral hatred of capitalism, you're not going to be able to become, quote, organic intellectual or any kind of revolutionary intellectual. And you know, Godard had a great saying since Godard came up earlier, in order to be 
a, a revolutionary intellectual, one has to give up being an intellectual. And that's a Gramscian comment. Yeah. Yeah. In order to be a revolutionary intellectual, one must relinquish being uh, an intellectual. Or, or like Marx. Or like Marx. Marx by Absolutely. saying, in order to change society, you have to stop right. doing philosophy. And the in order to redo it again, right. anew. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the educators must be educated themselves in the thesis on Feuerbach. So I think all of these, you know, kind of propositions are playing very actively in the formation of Antonio Gramsci and his, his message, you know, which, you know, sometimes comes across as didactic, at other times very free and open, you know, I mean, it's, you know, you can go through the, the style here in multiple cases. So I just want to point out some things that I at least found interesting, and I'm certainly open to what you're, um, what you're, what you're thinking. Um, um, let, let me just uh, go to something, the section on catharsis, which is later in the uh, study of philosophy. This is on page, um, uh, boy, let me see. Uh, yeah, it's on page 366, the term catharsis, and this is a very original way of looking at catharsis. The term catharsis can be employed to indicate the passage from the purely economic or egoistic, passional, to the ethico-political moment that is the superior elaboration of the structure into the superstructure in the minds of men. This also means the passage from objective to subjective, from necessity to freedom, which of course is Marx. We must pass through the realm of necessity before we can even speak of freedom, much less experience it. Structure ceases to be an external force which crushes man, assimilates him to its, himself, itself, and makes him passive, and is transformed into a means of freedom, an instrument to create a new ethico-political form and a source of new initiatives. To establish the cathartic moment becomes, therefore, it seems to me, the starting point for all philosophy of praxis. What Arto just mentioned, philosophy is dead, long live philosophy, let's create a new, you know, etc. And the cathartic process coincides with the chains of syntheses which have resulted from the evolution of the dialectic. This is a very interesting look at what catharsis means, which, you know, as most of you know, in Greek tragedy was the expurgation of fear and pity, right? And that you, you suffer with Oedipus during the play, and that was the role of the play, is to rid you of this, you know, complex, ab reaction in, in psychoanalytic uh, Raised theory. above. Raised above. The, yeah. the state of the hero. Right, right, exactly, right. So I think this is very interesting. The passage from the purely economic, we're getting screwed, the masses say, or the egoistic passional, right, <laughs> to the ethical political moment, right, that is the superior elaboration of the structure into the superstructure in the man, minds of men. This means the passage from the objective back to the subjective and from necessity to freedom. Structure ceases to be an outside or an external force which crosses man, assimilates him to itself, and makes him passive. Right? Again, this is a call towards agency, I think, through catharsis. Right? That you're rendered, remember, it's the structure. It's the structure doing this. We can't change. Right? It's structure versus agency. Ramshi is trying to put the both together here. Yeah? This is one of his, his moments been transformed into a means of freedom, an instrument to create a new ethical political form and a source of new initiatives to establish the catharsic moment becomes therefore, it seems to me, the starting point for all of Marxism. The starting point for all of Marxism. Right? And the catharsic process coincides with the change of synthesis which has resulted from the evolution of the dialectic. And you can see the, foot, the two points where this process oscillates, no society poses for itself problems, the necessity and sufficient conditions, necessary and sufficient conditions for which the solution do not already exist are coming into being, and that no society comes to an end before it's expressed all its potential content. This is the footnote that he, he refers to here, the evolution of the dialectic, right? And, you know so much for Fukuyama here. This is your answer to Fukuyama's end of history. And, 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 yeah. Good. 
Okay. Any, any thoughts about this? I mean, this is, uh, again, the starting point for Marxism, for philosophy of praxis, is this cathartic moment, right? This cathartic moment. A passage from the objective to the subjective, from necessity to freedom, the movement out of the economic to the ethno-political movement, and you can see in the footnote there, too, the Croatian system, you know, he talks about the, pr the particular economic or corporate to the universal, you know, he speaks of this, uh, to go back in, the, in the, the section on language that we read two, three weeks ago, you know, about the dialect, right, is open and prone to the economic, economic, corporatist kind of, uh, you know, uh, behavior, right? This is the sitting duck. And go back about today's discussion for those of you in the Benjamin uh, session, uh, you know, how fascism appeals to a certain kind of, you know, aesthetic, right? How it appeals to a certain type, you know, in terms of the aestheticization of objects. Right? So, any, any, any? Speed. Yeah, speed. Well, of course. Yeah. yeah. Speed. It, it, could, I mean, it could be interesting just to think about Gramsci in relation to the economic and philosophic manuscripts. You know, just, yes. Just trying to think of the, like what you just what you just read. Yes. What Marx lays out there, both in his critique of Hegel, but also just in his kind of articulating of the reality of you know what's translated as man. You know, right. What is man? Is, right. So I'm just kind of just thinking about the two in relation to each other. Right. You know, what is Gramsci's relationship to something like the economic? Well, first of all, he's in prison when they're published. I mean, if you want to look at this textually. I think he's, yeah. I mean, the economic and philosophical manuscripts are not discovered until 1932. So Gramsci has already been arrested since 26 and has been in prison uh, from 28 on. So he he's already read, four he years in. No, he never read. So uh, as far as I know, he never read the, the so-called Paris manuscripts. They're called the Paris manuscripts because that's where he, Marx wrote them. When you go into this question of man, yes, Marx is still in, 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 indulging himself, if you will, and this is a critique that Althusser, Heidegger, and others have <laughs> of, of, of the early Marx. He's still in the anthropological moment. He still speaks of man, and he speaks of species being, right? Doesn't speak of the ontology like a Heidegger does, or ultimately, in, in, in Althusser's case, a, a kind of post-humanist, you know, So to moment. what you just said, which I had no yeah, idea, sure. which is an, uh, actually sort of a, an amazing thing to, know, to think, that yes. he didn't read that, didn't know it. What of Marx did Gramsci know and read? Well, I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure, I know he knows Capital, okay. you know, because he wrote a piece called The Revolution Against Capital. <laughs> You know, and he read Capital very seriously. I'm sure he read philosophy of uh, the, the critique of the philosophy of right, the critique of the Hegelian system to a degree. You know, he, he understood this very well. I mean, remember that Gramsci is coming out of a Hegelian Marxist tradition. You know, it's Croce who is his idealist, you know, antagonist in all of this. You know, his, his teacher and someone he admires and. Croce never went the way of Mussolini completely, but was not attacked during the Mussolini period, during the fascist uh, moment. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think he knew, uh, he knew a lot of Marx, yeah, and he knew a lot of Lenin, you know, we, we talked about this too, that, you know, he was in Moscow, Lenin was very admiring of him in his conflicts with Bordiga, right, and uh, with Amadeo Bordiga and the, and the party and the movement. But at the same time, I think that, you know, he, 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 no, he was not aware of the Paris manuscripts unless it was completely by hearsay, and I doubt the other Italian prisoners next to him were getting, you know, out of the Soviet Union the latest word on, uh, you know, the Paris manuscripts. Yeah. But there are connections, obviously, and that they're thinking the same way. And, you know, one of the criticism, again, going back to the Frankfurt School, Gramsci and all of this, is that Gramsci stays in the anthropological. This is philosophical anthropology, and it's not a, a post, right, kind of philosophy that goes beyond what is man. Right? Yeah. So this is another... Another thing that uh, you know he's been 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 criticized from from the standpoint of philosophy. Mm -hmm. 
the standpoint of philosophy. That, you know, he still remains in the humanist uh, moment. But I think this is interesting, though, that without the catharsis, what he's talking about, you have no starting point for Marx. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. But yeah. there's an interesting yeah. thing about this, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, uh, which is, I think, pr probably the point of uh, misunderstanding of Gramsci by maybe somebody like uh, like the Frankfurt School at the time, the 20s or 30s. Because when they looked at the philosophical anthropology of a Gramsci or like uh, of, of early Marx, they you know they don't they kind of miss the point, which is you know <coughs> when like what was Marx's revision of Hegel, right? So Marx's revision of Hegel was that um, you know uh, up until that point in Western philosophy, you know there's this notion of or in Hegel in German philosophy, there's this notion of the single origin, right? So everything is reducible to, for example, a single source. Uh, against which, or, in, or in, in sort of tension against, against this particular origin, all the human actions actualize. So whether that's God, or whether that's some kind of absolute reason, or the truth, right? That is, is it, like accessible, um, like there's some kind of a Platonic or Aristotelian notion. And then Marx basically says, actually, there are multiple origins, you know, because the origins are actually the 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 the, the, the work of human. You know, we by by uh, human sort of well, the uh, multiplicity of determination. We have multiplicity of determination. Right, 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 right. So yeah. we don't need a god. We don't, and Nietzsche said they're the same thing, right? That God is dead in a certain way. But Marx is basically saying we have multiple determinations of our ontology, of our of our being. So we don't need to constantly strive to achieve this one. You know, and Gramsci already has internalized that. He doesn't need to sort of pay homage to. Of course, he's going to focus <coughs> on the human because the human is actually the the origin, you know, he doesn't need to concern himself with uh, objectivism or some kind of uh, pursuit of, of logical truth the way, for example, um, uh, scientists do, right? Yeah. The way post-Cartesian, like contemporary scientists do, like, this is objective because it's true, because it's verifiable because of this or that. And in the Marxist language, which builds on Hegel, is just that unlike Hegel, I don't know if that's true about Hegel either, because I don't know Hegel that well, but and the more I read about Hegel, the more I realize that he's very close to, Marx is very close to Hegel. Um, there's already, already a multiplicity. In other words, the world is open from our point of view, and and we are sort of masters of our own destiny in a certain, that's like a simple way of, of saying it, but we don't need to obsess with uh, removing ourselves and our thinking about our, our world, because that would kind of move us away from the truth you know there's no need to do that for Gramsci because he's already uh, internalized and, and and abandoned any kind of desire to like understand capitalism or revolutionary politics by appealing for some kind of truth that's outside of a human you know and I think in that sense maybe we could say that Althusser's reading might have missed this kind of nuance later on that would be like an interesting question if, if the epistemological break that, that Mar uh, Althusser talks about in Marx was maybe he kind of missed this point. But uh, that's just a provocation for later. Okay, <laughs> well, we'll keep that open. I mean, that's been, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, how can you leave the human out of the equation? Yeah, yeah. You know, is it all structural and, uh, yeah, and et cetera? And, you know, is it really, you know... But it does uh -huh. form an interesting connection with Heidegger also in the 1920s, right? Like this kind of reading of Marx. But we shouldn't talk about that now because it'll take us away. From well, I mean, uh, yeah. You want to say? Uh, no, yeah. I'm just yeah. thinking about the notion. Is it really accurate to say that there are multiple determinations of our ontology? Because, I mean, there are multiple. If the multiple determinations are cult, it is, it's maybe culture, but on the level of ontology, there's really just species being. It isn't. It isn't a mu there aren't multiple determinations of species being. There is nature, full stop. You know, it's not open to multiple determinations. It is what it is. You mean like you're, you're paraphrasing Marx? But the relation, the relation is, is multi-determined. Not nature itself, but you're relate, right. But, but I mean the multi-determinations are coming out of this, right. the, the social relations of consciousness. It is part of cultural production. Uh -huh. is, the, is it, in a sense, the Frankfurt kind of interpretation right. of that is is to some extent Gramsci's work is in the cultural determinations but if in Marx's terms it seems it's really just the ontology of ontology it's not the you know postmodern ontology 
of multiple ontologies. There's a, it's a singular ontology. Well, I mean, the ontology, I mean, look, if you, if you look at ontology, I'll, I'll do something here. I don't know if this will help, but this is kind of a generality one, if you will. You can think of ontology in our epoch, you can think of, you know, a being, right? You think, think of being in, in, in certain epochs. And since the Enlightenment, we have Marx being as value and being as production, right? The ontology is really an ontology of productive you know, being, or also the question of value. In Nietzsche, being as power, right? Even though there's overlaps, but this is really their discovery ontologically. Freud being as desire, right? And this kind of forms our modern, you know, moment, if you will, right? In many ways, right? Uh, you know, this is, this is what happens with, with being. So the ontology is really power, desire, production, Right, in in some ways, and then Marx's discovery is you know productive being, species bringing right in so relation what, with nature. That's what defines yeah. the human from the yes, human. Yes, the yes, to exactly. The, the although the bees are not conscious, no, no. Yeah. He says the bee is bee produces right. He has these wonderful analogies. One based on Mandeville's fable of the bees. He has these wonderful um, you know uh, 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 descriptions right of the bee at work or the ants. Perfect, like perfect division of labor in all of this, etc. But what they're lacking is consciousness, right? So that's another thing. You have being and consciousness working together, which opens up the question that Heidegger, I think, very, 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 uh, uh, one of his best moments, right? When he says, we must interrogate the being of consciousness of our era, right? We must interrogate the ontology that, uh, of, of, of consciousness itself. And this is where Heidegger begins to deviate from the humanist tradition, etc. So one of the things I, I think you're bringing up, I mean, I'm trying to, you know, I mean, again, just frame this. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, one, one of the things I think you're, you're bringing up is, 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 you know, where is man in all of this? Where is man's place, right, so to speak, or the anthropos, or man and woman, or the human species being? So I think it's more productive to not think only in terms of species being, because I think that language is dominant, you know, and Marx, you know, as you know, wanted to dedicate the second volume of Capital to Darwin, right? <laughs> Very much think Darwin said no. <laughs> he wrote him a letter. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, the, to, to get away, to, to, the, this, this, this language of species being, if we begin to think it as ontologies of power, desire, and production, we're getting into something, you know, more, quote, structural, you know, and less, you know, quote, unquote, always anthropomorph-centric, if you will, right, in a way. Because we're, what we're really trying to do, I think, I mean, you know, going forward, is to decenter, <laughs> you know, the kind of egocentric, if you will, or, you know, human-centric, <laughs> if I can use a term like that, you know, approach to all of this, right? In, in, in a sense. Yeah, please, go ahead. I, Especially with the machine age and all these other things we can, you know, extrapolate to. Yeah, yeah, um, if, yeah. Uh, if I'm understanding it right, the, yeah. uh, part of the, 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 the way that we can see the break between the humanist Marx and, and the later Marx is that by, um, like, chapter six in uh, Capital Volume One, when he's talking about the production of labor power, right. it becomes very difficult to fix, uh, like, an essential species being because the subject, the subject is capital, and capital produces different kinds of subjectivities that capital needs. So, so the production right. of labor power means the production of certain kinds of people yes. to occupy yes. a certain kind, certain position in the division of labor. Right. So once he sees, once he starts studying the structure and the way the structure produces forms of humanity, right. there's no way then to talk about a central species being right. that I agree is the with same that. no matter what. And that's an Althusserian position, and that's a yeah. position also of what, uh, uh, in the Marxist tradition, you know, the human is not so much the element, it's the support, the structural support, the trigger. That's what you're destructuring. This is what a Negre does so well in terms of destructuration, in terms of his readings, not only in the Grundry, so and we'll see this maybe in time uh, uh, and uh, for revolution later on uh, when we read that. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's important because, again, look, 
we're, we have a socialization of ideas problem too, right? We, we're kind of brought up on, you know, the, uh, the, um, uh, the economic and philosophical manuscripts, you know, man's alienation. We're, we'll talk about this. We're, we're brought up on these kind of terms. However, what's lost in that is exactly what you bring up, this structural moment that does produce a lot of the effects in us, you know, makes our worlds change, right? <laughs> Modifies, transforms constantly. So we become, it's not so much the species being, it's the effects of being as production that we're experiencing, being as power, being as desire that we're experiencing that produces the new subjectivities, I think. I mean, I think that's, that's one way of looking at this, right? For the Althusserian, the continent that's opened up, the epistemological break is that Marx discovers history capitalized, right? It's a whole new way of doing history. Not only are you going to date history through modes of production, but you're going to also look at, you know, history in terms of breaks and ruptures, right? No longer as linear, chronological, or evolutionary. <laughs> you're going to start to look at ruptures and breaks and these kind of things, of which the French, you know, take up, you know, in a, in a very different way than the Germans who are much more organic unfolding in, 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 in some ways. So this is the French reading of, uh, of um, you know, of, uh, of the Marxist tradition. I'm sorry? Foucault. Yeah. Foucault, certainly, in terms of breaks and ruptures. So he gets this from Althusser, and Althusser gets it from, uh, from uh, Gaston Bachelot, right? Who, you know, <laughs> And, uh, you know, you have this all throughout their, uh, their history, right? And I, I mean, and biopolitics in Foucault is very much a, I mean, he's, he's trying to figure out concretely how subjects are being produced in this particular... Absolutely. I mean, Foucault, to my mind, I mean, is, is again, you know, the real historian of our time in, in many ways that he really understands, and, and, and a lot of Marxists are so left behind, including people that are of the Althusserian vein, like a body bar and others, that they don't take the biopolitical turn. You know, the biopolitical turn is very essential for Marx and Marxism to encounter this biopolitical turn, you know, that, that went on. I mean, you have to remember, listen, we're living, again, we're 50 years almost, almost a half a century into the Chicago Boys School economics, a kind of new behavioral school of psychology against psychoanalysis. We're into this, you know, whole new kind of propaganda machine, and really, the the stuff is really based on life against death. The, the The political question is really the struggle, as Marcuse puts it in '66, the fight for eros. I think it's the fight for life itself. I mean, at this at this point, this is what Occupy Wall Street should have talked about. It wasn't just economics. And, you know, this is again, I put on the board the attack in Gramsci and others is on Homo economics you know, economicus, the economic determinism of the moment. This is all we did, the 1%. Right? But nobody really talked about biopower or to speak to the, to the level of, you know, these were questions of existence. Really, ultimately, an, an existential problem or a life problem, you know, beyond that of the biological. The biopolitical is a strategy in some ways to manage the planet, you know, I mean, I don't know if you guys have looked at this new geoengineering climate change by Gates and Peter Thiel and all this kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. this is another thing that's really going down now, this bioengineering that's happening, biocapital, well, biopharma, pharma capital, you know, I mean, these are very interesting we things. Are in the and of, uh, yeah. sort of the invention of race, I mean, the, the yes. racist argument is, yes. could become real, Absolutely. actually, well, we're, I mean, look, of humans and all these dreams. My good and, friend Peter Bratz has said some shit's going to really hit the fan, you know, that something's going on when Peter Cavalier is going to be. Why do you care? <laughs> He's saying there's going to be real shit hitting the fan. Well, We're in a civil war. You know, I, think I mean, this is an obvious thing. This has been going on for a long time. It's like Marx in the manifesto. Sometimes the struggle appears as manifest. Other times it's latent. we got a manifest civil war going on in this country right now. Wouldn't yeah. you say that Agamben deals with the biopolitical? Yes. 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 Yeah, Gombin is another one, forward. but he's very pessimistic. Uh, Gombin is more out of the Benjaminian Adorno vein and Heideggerian vein than he is out of the Marxist. Whereas Foucault, I think, incorporates a lot of Marx into his work and a lot of the Frankfurt School. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, I'm uh, just trying to yeah. think where is the biopolitical going after Foucault? Well, oh, you mean who are the thinkers? Yeah, who, who The are thinkers are, are really, uh, Agamben is probably the most representative of this. Yeah, I don't know if you guys, you know Giorgio Agamben at all? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Um, um, Barely. Yeah, um, Homo mm -hmm. Sacer. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he, he, he's rethinking the, the, the term that you probably brought up, uh, Nomos, you brought up Nomos last week? No, you didn't, okay, you're gonna teach a course on that though. Well, huh? Right, sure, okay, yeah. all right. Uh, the Nomos, um, the Nomos um, uh, um, of our, our time is really we, the concentration camp. Mm -hmm. We really live in the concentration camp. I mean, we don't see the marble, you know, we see it at the borders and, you know, in certain places, but he thinks that the modern construct is basically the concentration the camp. The city is a camp. The city is a camp. Right, yeah. The city state of exception. State of exception, we're always living in this, and state of exception is words used in the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. right. You know, this is another thing. Mm -hmm. Why language is so important and why history is so important, because it does repeat itself, maybe in different forms. Maybe the first time is tragedy, the second time is farce, the third time is pastiche. <laughs> you know, we can go through all kinds of literary genres to see this, but it's very important. And, and I, I don't think that... The, uh, the, the rulers are that stupid. I think they want to eliminate history because history makes one dangerous and educated. And you don't see this privileging of history in the schools anymore. These kids that come to university don't have any sense of history. I hear stories of PhDs in history don't know when World War One, uh, World War II ended, much less World War One. right? You know, they wouldn't be able to situate Marx, uh, you know, we're going to do the Gotha program uh, later today. You know, they would no idea when the Franco-Prussian War went on. Right? These are PhDs, not, not, not people just, uh, you know, out of high school. Yeah. So this, this attack upon history, this ahistoricism, is another thing. Another reason that I think Gramsci is very important for educational purposes. You know, this is someone who is privileging the historicist moment. It's not philosophy as an eternal thing or just creating new concepts or as Deleuze and Guattari say, to invent new concepts. It's to understand how that history of philosophy coincided with history itself. What gave rise to these conceptual formations? How does this work alongside of historical materialism? How then does the idea itself, the ideas themselves, become socialized into common sense, which we take for granted, <laughs> we don't question, <laughs> and we move with, right? And we don't, you know, critique, etc. This is where he's really going, and I think this is very valuable. Which brings me to, you know, there's another section in here I just want to emphasize, and then I'll move on to Marx. Um, the, the other, the other um, uh, section is the Jesuitism and Marxism, which he only glances at, but it, most of you know that Jesuitism was formed as a you know, society yeah. to confront the Dominicans and the Franciscans. What page? Um, let me see. Yeah. I think it's in the know. first section, 340-something. <laughs> let me see. My bad. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, pages uh, 330, 331. Um, actually, yeah, uh, I mean, actually going back to 328 uh, about the Catholic Church. But the Jesuitism emerges uh, primarily on page uh, 332 as part of the Connor Reformation. 332 is the page. And the Jesuitism itself was, you know, Jesuitism, the Society of Jesus, <coughs> was created by Ignatius Loyola, you know, um, of which we have many universities and high schools named for. And Ignatius Loyola um, um, basically uh, created a kind of paramilitary operation, right? The Catholic Church was in need of something to confront the Franciscans and the Dominicans, both of whom were gaining you know, tremendous moments, right, as well as against Protestantism. So they create this cadre, and he's looking at cadre formation here, you know, a kind of intellectual class, a traditional intellectual class that is born in the 16th century, right? So he's going to confront this. What he sees here is that even though they're extremely good educators, and Jesuits are good educators, I mean, they're disciplined, they're extremely good, it's really ultimately an ideology of control. You know, it becomes a pedagogy of control. 
it's controlling the masses, etc. And he'll juxtapose this to Marxism or philosophy of praxis, which he considers to be liberating because it has a higher conception of life, and I think his words are well chosen, higher conception of life instead of higher God, right? As in the church, right? It's the higher conception of life itself in the here and now that he kind of juxtaposes here. So again, it's the winning over in common sense, right, of the mass at this at this point. Yeah. What well, was the threat of uh, that the uh, Franciscans and the Dominicans were posing? They, they were getting the poor mobilized. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, Negre goes back to this, by the way, I mean, since Negre was on, very much so in, in terms of the Franciscans, you know. I mean, Negre's a, a very, a real militant, you know, in a way. I mean, you can disagree with him, but Negre is kind of out of the cloth of Gramsci and Lukács more than a lot of the, uh, you know, <laughs> other characters on the block here. And very, extremely militant, and, you know. It may be because of the Italian background, I'm not trying to make it a culturalist argument, but it seems to me that the Machiavelli to Marx is a, is a very different animal than from Luther you know, to Kant. I don't know. <laughs> right? I mean, one of his early, I'm, I'm one of his early yeah, books, which is before. Books for Burning. <laughs> books for Burning. You say that <clears throat> Negre is anti-humanist and yes, beyond Marx. Yes, yes, very much so. Yeah, he's anti-humanist. I mean, the Althusserian break and then all that happened around that, you know, kind of produced some of the best Italian thinking. Bifo, Franco Barardi, Maurizio Lazzarato, you know, Negre, Franco Perperno, uh, Paolo, Paolo Verno, all of these people kind anti of come Anti-humanist. Anti-humanist, all of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but let's go to let's go to the humanist. I, I wanted to mention this about, and the Jesuitism still re re remains today. This is teaching to the test is a form of Jesuitism. The regents and all of this that we're witnessing in the schools, in a, in a lot of ways, and also how this controlled for so many generations. And what did the Jesuitism in Italy become? The Christian Democratic Party, which, as you know, won the elections post World War II. That defeated the communists, and this was Operation. This is well known. I mean, I'm not saying it was, a, it was a CIA operation. Yeah, was a CIA, CIA, operation. CIA, CIA operation. Operation Sword. Yeah, they're so clever. <laughs> the language they come up with. <laughs> it's like like Rocky Balboa, I mean, the, the Apollo Creed. This is a opponent, right? I mean, you know, all these this codes. This is what Norman O'Brien and Marcusa did during the war. They decoded, because of their classics background, their philosophy background, they decoded Nazi, uh, Nazi war codes. <laughs> they were so good at this stuff. Yeah. Anyway, all right. So let's, let, let, let's move on to Marx, and I'll try to situate this, and I'll, I'll do my best to go back, you know, and kind of integrate uh, Gramsci in the, in the future, since there, there are more, more things there to go over. Okay, this is a text, like I mentioned, 1844. Marx is under the influence of Frederick Engels. For those of you that have not seen the film by Raoul Peck, I recommend it. Very good, the young Karl Marx. It's excellent. It has a very special, you know, treatment of the relationship to Engels, and Marx beats him in chess in the, in the clubs. But Engels is the one who introduces Marx somewhat to political economy. Right? And he makes him read Ricardo and Smith. So this is Marx's kind of notes on his first encounters, if you will, um, economic ma manuscripts, his first encounters with David Ricardo and Adam Smith. Okay? Uh, the principles of taxation, you know, the principles of political economy, as well as the wealth of nations. He's reading all of this. And most of you probably know Adam Smith also wrote a bourgeois morality the theory of moral sentiments <laughs> alongside of the Wealth of Nations. Wealth of Nations, by the way, is published uh, in 1776, the same year as our great revolution here, at the Boston uh, Tea Party, right, et cetera. So anyway, um, so he, he, he's, he's reading these people for the first time. I mean, it takes much more fruition and years of maturation to really engage this, where he engages these people much more in the Grundrisse, you know, to trace this out in Marx's development. The Grundrisse is the next place where he becomes very elaborate in notebooks on political economy. 
right? And the Grundrisse being, you know, in German, really the blueprint or the groundwork or the ground ripping apart, you know, notes for the future, 1857 to 58. So this is 19, 18, four, uh, 1857 to 58 is the Grundrisse and the, um, the Economic and Philosophical Manuscript, 1844. So Marx is only 26 when he's writing this humanist stuff, right? <laughs> you know, he's born 1818. So this is, this is written in Paris before he's exiled from Paris. Um, uh, 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 you know, and the economic. So I did not assign the economic. I wanted us to look at, you know, categories that are central to the humanist Marx tradition. One being, of course, Entfremmung in German, which means estrangement, estrangement from one's labor. And then ultimately, that estrangement, you know, is also legal alienation, another German word uh, that's in the glossary, and and Santrum, and Santrum, uh, you know, that uh, Struwick uh, points out. So, you know, you have multiple forms of alienation working here in estrangement uh, in Marx. So this is this is going to begin on page in the. Uh, Struick, and the Struick introduction is very good, by the way. This is on page 106, A Strange Labor, and uh, he, he I, I didn't have you read the political, because this is not, you know, a course in political economy, right? We're trying to look at philosophical conceptualization. Uh, the estranged labor, we have proceeded from the premises of political economy. We accept its laws and language, right? So we presuppose private property, the separation of labor, capital, and land, and as you know, the modern trinity, labor, land, and capital, in the, uh, that's the Trinitarian formula, the modern trinity for Marx, the Trinitarian formula and capital, in book three, you know, three components, labor, land, right, and capital. You can look at this whole thing of the marijuana production in Canada that I've become kind of attuned to uh, recently, not because of being uh, you know, a, a weed toker uh, anymore, but uh, uh, just kind of curious about how production, distribution, consumption, and exchange is going to take place in all of this, because this is a multi-billion dollar industry. A so you're getting in, you're getting in on the ground floor. I am on the, gr yeah, the ground <laughs> floor. Is all right. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the big, the big, uh, the big, uh, the big company is Canopy Growth. And their product is called Tweed, not weed, but That's Tweed. Jamaican and it comes with Is it Jamaican? I mean, yeah, I know the guy who, st who started it. Okay. Uh, we okay. went to high school <laughs> together. Lyndon? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lyndon. Uh, no, um, Raul Haynes. Okay. He's a Tweed guy. Oh, he, yeah, okay. But mm -hmm. Canopy Growth has the. Uh, Canopy Growth has, has the. They the, bought the distribution them, I believe, yeah. bought them out. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. That's good. You have good contacts there, Rachel. It's yeah, Jamaica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What can you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What can you Make say? a score yeah. for me. Sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. No yeah. problem. All right, good. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, on the basis of political, we have shown that the worker <laughs> sinks to the level of the commodity. So, you know, here already at 26, he's aware of of labor power only. What does the labor have to sell? Just labor power as commodity and becomes indeed the most wretched of commodities and that the wretchedness of the worker is in inverse proportion to the power and magnitude of his production. So already Marx has seen this very well, this whole process of exploitation. Okay? Now, Political economy, I'm going to go down a little bit, does not start with the fact of private property, but it does not explain it to us. It expresses in general abstract formulas, the material processes through which private property actually passes, and then it takes these formulas as laws. This is a criticism of both Adam Smith and Ricardo. You know, what happens with the fact of private property when they begin there? It does not comprehend the law, it does not demonstrate how they arise from the very nature of private property. So this is the first critique, if you will, of political economy, which as you know is the front piece to the, the Grundrisse, and in this book at the end they have Engels's, you know, critique of political economy going on. So you have to remember, Marx is not doing political economy. He is basically doing a critique of political economy, right? Remember this. You know, this is not a set of object of homo economicus or uh, economic determinism or, for that matter, 
you know, a study only of political economy. It's an outright thorough critique. And let me just point out one definition in the Grundrisse of political, of, of communism is the relentless critique of uh, moving towards real movement. That's what communism is, real movement. Yeah, and in that critique, you're getting the, the, the real movement, right? This relentless critique. So this is what's going to go on in his mind if you want to read with him. It's really accelerated critique constantly, you know, nothing but. Right? So um, political economy does not dis disclose the source of the division between labor and capital, between capital and land. Right? What, for example, it defines the relationship of wages to profit. It takes the interest of the capitalist to be the ultimate cause. It takes for granted what it's supposed to explain. Similarly, competition comes in everywhere, explained from external circumstances. And as far as these external and apparently accidental circumstances are but the expression of a necessary course of development, political economy teaches us nothing. Nothing. We learn nothing from Smith. We learn nothing from Ferguson. We learn nothing from Rick David Ricardo in this way. We have seen how exchange itself appears to it as an accidental fact. Yeah, yeah. This magic marker for a dollar twenty-five is an accident in the history of economics, in the history of barter exchange going forward. Just an accidental. The only wheels which political economy sets in motion, and this is the way people speak all the time, and I'm sure we're going to get this from the socialist candidates' mouths: greed and the war among the greedy. <laughs> That is competition. That's the war among the greedy. That make a good cereal in the morning. <laughs> war against the greedy. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, precisely because political economy does not grasp the way the movement is connected, it's possible to oppose, for instance, the doctrine of competition to the doctrine of monopoly, the doctrine of the freedom of the crafts to the doctrine of the guild, the doctrine of the division of landed property to the doctrine of the biggest state. A state for competition, freedom of the crafts, and the division of landed property were explained and comprehended only as accidental, premeditated, and violent consequences of monopoly and of the guild system and of feudal property, not as their necessary, inevitable, and natural consequences. So here he's doing a structural evolution instead of a rupture with anything in his critique. So very logical here in the way he's unfolding this, based on premises. So this is well before, so for the Althusserians, this work still stays within the old Hegelian logic, right? Of which um, Arto is reading, you know, it's really within this organic, you know, this organic unfolding of how this comes to be, right? In a sense, okay? So, so in order to grasp, we have to grasp the essential connection between private property Greed, separation of land capital and landed property, between exchange and competition, value and the devaluation of men, monopoly and competition, the connection between this whole estrangement and the money system. Okay, so very early on, you can see 26 years old, beginning to think this through, right? But thinking it through from very logical Hegelian categories. You, know, you can see a kind of organic dialectic unfolding here an evolutionary dialectic, if you will. Do not go back into a fictitious, do not let's go back to a fictitious primordial condition, Robinson Crusoe, the Crusades, if you've read Capital, you know, <laughs> but it eliminates Friday from the <laughs> equation, right? <laughs> As the political economist does, he tries to explain, such a primordial condition establishes nothing. It merely pushes the question away into a gray nebulous distance and assumes in the form of a fact an event what the economist is supposed to deduce, namely the necessary relationship between two things, that is, for example, the division of labor and exchange. Theology, in the same way, explains, this is great, <laughs> the origin of evil by the fall of man. That is, it assumes as a fact in historical form what has to be explained. We proceed, in our case, from the economic fact of the present. So he's going to always do that. Let's take the present as our condition. The worker becomes all the more poor, the more wealth he produces. 
So if you're a worker and you're really reading and you're thinking, you know, et cetera, and Ms. Ocasio, I'm sorry to use her as a straw, uh, you know, argument, but anyway, um, you know, this is the kind of stuff why you read, right? What does this mean? The more becomes the poor, the more wealth you produce. Yeah. How does this happen? How does this occur? What is going on? What kind of system is this? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Is this good? Yeah, etc. The more his production increases in power and size, the worker becomes an ever cheaper commodity. The more commodities he creates. With the increasing value of the world of things proceeds in direct proportion to the devaluation of the world of men. Labor produces not only commodities, it produces itself and the worker as a commodity, and this in the same general proportion in which it produces commodities. This fact expresses merely that the object which labor produces, labor's product, confronts it as something alien as a power independent of the producer. So he's going to now go into a very early form of what estranged labor is, why we feel so estranged from what we produce or what the worker produces. The product of labor, which has been embodied in an object which has become material, is the objectification of labor. And we're going to look at this, of course, Lukács will make a lot of this in, in the reification section in History and Class Consciousness. One of the reasons I'm reading this, because Lukács, even though it's nine years after this is published, Lukács in 1923 is already very well aware of this externalization and reified process, right? Very, very well done in terms of his early work, the, the history of class consciousness. Labor's realization is its own objectification. In the sphere of political economy, this realization of labor appears as the loss of realization for the workers. You get lost in the product. You have no realization, no self-realization in this. You know, one of our reasons we have, you know, maybe in some ways, psychically, such an attraction to crafts, you know, in some ways, in the past. That at least you could feel, you know, the sensuous material. You know, I have some mahogany stuff in uh, my place in Montreal, and you can see the detail of the craftsmanship and all of that, and you wonder, you know, these are people that probably had some fulfillment out of making this, you know, that it was a different kind of a sensuous activity before factory labor, before, you know, this kind of assembly line. Well, assembly line's not in process yet, but certainly the factory labor is. Objectification is the loss, and this is beautiful, as loss of the object and a bondage to it. Right? Appropriation as estrangement, as alienation. Right? Together. Right? Estrangement and that. So much does labor's realization appear as loss of realization, the worker loses realization to the point of starving to death. Right? This can happen. So much does objectification appear as the loss of the object of the worker is robbed, yeah, 26 years old, of the objects most necessary not only for his life, but for his work. Indeed, labor itself becomes an object which he can obtain only with the greatest effort and with the most irregular interruptions. So much does the appropriation of the object appear as estrangement that the more objects the workers produce, the less he can possess. The more you produce, the less you're able to possess, the less you feel part of realization realization processes, and the more he falls under the sway of his product, and what is that product? Capital. Capital. Right? Okay? Yeah. So all these consequences result that the worker is related to the product of his labor to as an alien object. So this is how he's going to begin, you know, his, his analysis of alienation and strange labor, that the worker is always already estranged from anything that they produce. It does not produce anything in terms of value. You know, we're going to talk about later today, uh, each according to one's needs, each according to one's abilities. This is the farthest thing away from the capitalist mind and from the process's mind, right? Nothing about the needs of the human, right? And then go back to this. Okay, so um, let, me, let me do one thing and then maybe we'll pick up with this um, um, 
you know, uh, next time and, 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 and the Lukács. I want to go to the critique of the Hegelian philosophy just to point out a couple of things, if you don't mind. And, uh, you know, he'll go on here to talk about alienation, uh, the act of production and the labor process. Um, um, and, you know, um, um, and he uses the term on 114, the stage labor thus becomes man's species being, both nature and his spiritual species property, into a being alien to him. So Marx is always talking about alienation in multiple forms, right? Alienation from nature, alienation from the spirit, right, if you will, that could be talked about as, as, as religious alienation, or I like to speak of it as Cornel West likes it in the, the sense of Coltrane's spiritual, you know, notion, you know, of the, of, uh, you know, the spiritual as a part of an artistic moment, etc. But alienation from that as well, alienation from one's labor and product of that labor, and then that produces alienation from oneself, you know, or even building the self, ultimately to alienated relations in the society. So there seem to see be five basic processes in alienation itself, right? And this is strange labor. Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm riffing off of this, this right? This is it? Yeah, the critique of the, yeah. So a strange labor, both nature and spiritual speech, into a being alien, into a means to his individual, a means, not his individual existence, but as a means. And this is where instrumental reason and instrumentality comes in, too. It estranges man, his own body, as well as external nature, his spiritual essence, his human beingness. So for Marx, the spiritual nature was human beingness in the humanistic Marx, right? In, 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 in this way. Also, an immediate consequence, man is estranged from the product of his labor, from his life activity, very important, life activity, and from his speech, the estrangement of man from man, the alienated relations that we enter into, you know, both contractually and just in everyday life. Yeah, always these alienated, right? Okay, so... He asks questions. He's very funny. One fifteen. If my own activity does not believe, belong to me, if it is alien and coerced an activity, to whom then does it belong? To a being other than myself. That is the capitalist. Of course, who is this being? The gods. To be sure, in the earliest times, the principal production, you know, appears to be in the service of the gods and the product belong. Now, the gods on their own were never the lords of labor. No more was nature. And what a contradiction it would be if the more man subjected nature by his labor and more the miracles of the gods were rendered super, superfluous by the miracles industry, the more man would renounce the joy of production and the enjoyment of the product in favor of these powers. The alien being belongs in whose service it is done and for whose benefit the product of labor is provided can be only man himself. If the product does not belong to the worker, then it can only be because it belongs to someone other than the worker. If the worker's activity is a torment to another, it must be a delight. How beautifully this was produced, right? I didn't know they worked 10 hours to do this little thing all day in the sweated, you know, factory so we can, you know, etc. And his life, sure, not the gods, not nature, but man himself can be this alien power over man. So in a way, Marx is saying, nature is not alien to us. It's kind of interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Even though he's going to presuppose nature, right, as another power, it's really man is the alien power, right? Very, very interesting, the alien power over man. So he, be, he starts with that. Um, the exposition, the unresolved conflicts, page 117, um, political economy starts from labor as the real soul of production, right? Okay? Yet to labor it gives nothing and to profit property everything. This is a critique of Smith. Smith is the one who discovered the labor theory of value. You know, the source of value is created by the laborer. This is Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, not Karl Marx. Marx is going to go be well beyond this, right? He, he takes a point of departure from that. Another thing about Marx that need to remember is it's not always a starting point. It's a point of departure that's going on always in these critiques. He's taking flight, right, conceptually. He's always making a move, I think, as a point of departure, not a point of arrival. Yeah, in a way, yeah. He'll get to the point of arrival in the result of his thinking. 
Okay, and then the relationship 118 of a strange labor to private property that the emancipation, and this is the first time he's going to start using this kind of language, of society from private property, that is from servitude, is expressed in the political form of the emancipation of the workers. So this is what Arto was talking about earlier, the invention of the proletariat. This becomes agency. You know, it's as early as 1844. This is four years before the manifesto of the Communist Party. It's a year before the German ideology in which the mapping of historical materialism, and I'll, I'll go over this too. And then he says, not that their emancipation alone is a stake, because the emancipation of the workers contains universal human emancipation. Universal. So universal, and it contains this because the whole of human servitude is involved in the relation of the worker to production, and every relation of servitude is but a modification and a consequence of this relation. Okay, so this, this is important to remember, right? And then he wants to solve the general nature of private property and the estrangement of labor at the end, and then the manuscripts breaks off, you know, at this point on 119. Okay, just a couple of comments and then I'll let you uh, uh, go here. A critique of the Hegelian dialectic philosophy, it's all page 170. This is really the first time he begins to really engage Feuerbach, right? Uh, um, you know, as a thinker, as a transitional figure from Hegel's abstract universalism into a concrete, you know, sensuous materialism, right? He's going to use Feuerbach as a critique of the Hegelian dialectic. I think I'm going to need more, more time with this. Um, I think what we can do is we can read the Lukács alongside of this too for next week, the reification, right? As well as, uh, you know, go over this. But page 172 is Forbach on uh, the one who made the critical attitude. He doesn't say the overturning, but a serious critical attitude, right? Marx is not Forbachian, even though that's a step, right, in terms of the critique of Hegelian idealism. This is done in the name of sensuous materialism and what he calls, um, you know, traditional materialism in Forbach. And this is in the 11 theses on Feuerbach to be read alongside the, the, what he's doing here, right? Okay, and his great achievement, Feuerbach, and he has three, three categories for Feuerbach's uh, achievement. Philosophy is nothing else but religion rendered into thought. And nothing truer is said. The relationship between philosophy and theology, philosophy for the most part, in the, in the history of ideas and how it's disseminated and the history of systems of thinking, there's no real tremendous separation between theology and philosophy. Marx was absolutely correct here. You get this in the Aquanian system, you get this in the, the versions of the ontological proof for the existence of God in Descartes, you begin to see this in Kant, God, man, and world, you know, the metaphysics, this stays up. So this is really very, very true, what he says here. Not that we should get rid of philosophy, you know? I mean, it's the end of philosophy, maybe the task of thinking, but at the same time, he is critiquing up to this point everything, and that Forbach's great contribution is to show uh, the estrangement of the essence of man, and, and that Forbach also gives the establishment of true materialism and real science makes the social relationship of man to man not mediated by God or by the theo theological mediation anymore. It's man to man. So this is the beginning of this philosophical anthropology that begins, you know, in the early humanistic marks, the relationship of man to man. Right? And who is Feuerbach? Feuerbach was Ludwig Feuerbach, who wrote a, a wonderful little piece called The Essence of Christianity. And he also worked for theories for the reform of philosophy. He was translated from German into English by George Eliot, <laughs> the writer, um, you know, uh, Daniel Deronda, Middlemarch, etc. And um, um, he was a German philosopher who really came up with. Um, you know, a new kind of materialism and inverts Hegel. You know, he's the one who really tries to stand Hegel back on his head, uh, you know, on his feet, right? Inverts Hegel, you know, to turn him upside down and make him on the ground again. Which and Marx takes Mark's his point as future. He does say that, yeah, yeah. But he's getting this from Feuerbach. Oh. Feuerbach says the gods are a projection of man. 
not the other way around. Up until that, you know, the outside was God and gods, right? Coming back in. But the, the specul the, prop the, the the projection, Feuerbach is interested in projection of man is the one who invented God, not the v way around that God was invented, you know, invented man. So this was, this came as pretty earth shattering to most of the people because you have this movement, and I mean this is something historically should be done. The young Hegelians, some were theological Hegelians, right? And you had this, this the, all these moments in German philosophy in which um, you know the theological Hegel was put out there you know, that somehow Hegel's absolute was really God and absolute knowledge, and it was a justification for this, right? That the sphere of religion meets philosophy and then ultimately they culminate in this spherical unfolding into God, you know, at the end of the dialectical journey, right? The phenomenology of spirit, which I recommend and maybe we should do it in these classes, you know, the, Hegel, the Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, because this is the book which Marx is riffing off of here very much. It's not so much the science of logic. We could do the preface, or we could do sections of it too, because he's gonna he's gonna critique this. You know, he's looking. And one thing I wanted to point out to you, um, when you look at these sections, the phenomenology, one page seventy three, that is the phenomenology itself. That's not Marx. That's what the phenomenology is divided into, which begins with self consciousness, right? Consciousness, certainty at the level of sense experience, this in meaning, perception, force and understanding, appearance in the supersensible world, self-consciousness, right, etc. The three shapes of consciousness, stoicism, skepticism, unhappy consciousness is basically Christianity. Three, reason, reason, certainty, and reason's truth, process, self-consciousness, rational, etc. Pleasure, necessity, law of the heart frenzy of self thing. So this is actually the progression, the table of contents that Marx is reproducing in his note, in his manuscripts that this editor decided we'll leave this in instead of just saying summary of, you know, Hegel's uh, uh, table of contents. Then the encyclopedia, beginning with absolute knowledge. So what you're, what you're reading here is basically a long, a commentary, if you will, on the phenomenology of spirit, right? or of Geist, which some people are now translating as community, the phenomenology of the community, you know, as such, right? So anyway, he's going to go through this, and man is objective, sensuous, and what Forbach contributes to this. So um, this is also something that Lukács does very well, a la Marx, in the section on reification. So hopefully there'll be some connections there. Yeah, yeah, okay? So, I mean, maybe I should end there unless there are any questions or comments, uh, uh, you know, at this point. I mean, I think this is a good transition. Look, this is a, this is a kind of transition from Gramsci as a humanist Marxist to one still believing in agency, right? <laughs> you know, it's not a, quote, structuralist Marxist, but a, a thinker of agency and praxis. To Marx, the early Marx, who's also thinking agency and is beginning to look at the labor question, you know, in a real way, and this is where he begins. And then, uh, thirdly, the movement into another humanist Marxist, Lukács, the reification essay. Yeah. Doing Lukács next. Yeah, reification. Yeah, and I'll I'll inform you if uh, I'm going to be here or not. But I'm, I'm so what? Uh, yeah. What are we reading more in the manuscript? I would read the week? critique of the Hegelian dialectic, which was for today, and I'll send out a summary and I'll I'll enhance it since we didn't you know do uh, all we should have done today in terms of Gramsci. I'll, I'll put out some other things in the, on the website. You know, to do this. You know, I couldn't yeah. get there. So. Okay. So you're, you're put yeah, I'll put the way. Thank you, David. Thank you again. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'll put the readings out on the website. But they're they're already. Yeah, I'll put the readings on the website as well as uh, a summary of today, as uh, you know, and anything that I passed over just because of restrictions of time. I'm unfortunately much more accustomed to three and a half hours. Two. Four and a half hours. Yeah. 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 Yeah.